Change my name forever free. 
I choose to worship, I choose to bow, when there's pain in the offering I lay it down, in every conflict, when doubts surround, though my soul is unraveling, I choose you now. I will praise you through the fire, through the storm and through the flood. There is nothing that could ever steal my soul. In the valley, you are worthy. You are good when life is not. You will always and forever be my soul. I build my own. Right here, right now In the midst of the darkest night It won't burn out For God, you're perfect No matter what In the joy or the suffering I sing it loud I will praise you through the fire through the storm and through the flood, there is nothing in the valley, Lord. You are worthy. You will always be my And when the enemy says I'm done, I lift my prayer. My world comes crashing down, I'll lift my praise high till the darkness turns to dawn. I choose to worship, I choose you now when the enemy says I.
So shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, huh? Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over Every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Come on, every voice, sing it out. Shout, Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over. Speak Jesus. 
worship Him. Come on, lift up your voices. Lift up your voices in this room. Hallelujah. Who has the interpretation of that word tonight? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 3 through 5, but everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening encouragement and comfort he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself but he who prophesies say prophesy he edifies the church I would like every one of you to speak in tongues but I would rather have you prophesy for he who prophesies is greater than one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so the church may be edified it's New Testament if we're gonna have a corporate word come forth in tongues that we don't understand in English, we need a translation of what God is saying. Hallelujah. Don't be scared. Who has the interpretation tonight? Mr. Sean? I hear the Spirit saying, I've heard your prayers. I've heard your cries. Don't be alarmed because I'm still here. But where has your fire gone? Where has your fire gone, church? Where is my fire that I have put inside of you to burn away the things that need to be burned away? This land needs this fire. Bring forth this fire. This fire that burns, this fire that never stops, this fire that quenches and takes away the darkness, it lights up the skies. Where have you gone? Where have you gone? I hear your calls, but what are you doing? What are you doing? Are you worrying about yourself? Or are you worrying about the sun? I hear your cries, but stand up, fight, and burn. Hallelujah. Jerry, come on up here, buddy.
Church, don't we serve a mighty God, such a, such a powerful God. We serve a God that can rewrite your story in just a look. And I want to tell you exactly what I mean. Ephesians 2.5 says, even when we were dead and doomed in our many sins, that he united our very life with Christ and he saved us through his wonderful grace. And I want to tell you what I mean by that real quick. I have lived a rough life. I have lived I'm a, from a fatherless home. I went to prison right out of high school and I have suffered beyond all imagination. I have suffered my entire adult life. I have not known what to do with myself. And my, I was on the verge of divorce and my sins were catching up with me. And I'm sitting in my truck one day, just crying uncontrollably knowing that I can't do anything about it. God brought me to the doorsteps of this church and I begged for help. <clears throat> Dennis, spent pastor dennis spent an hour with me praying praying over me we prayed together and something shifted that day when i left the church i wanted to read my bible i wanted to speak differently i wanted to listen to different music everything started to change that day you see i didn't realize it but god had reached the divine surgeon had reached into my chest and pulled a cold, broken, shattered heart right out. And he replaced it with a healthy, beating heart and he put his name all over that heart. Now my heart beats for God all day every day it's been the most wonderful thing that has ever happened in my entire life for the first time let me tell you why this is so special because it happened exactly one year ago today that's why i asked if i could say something for the first time in my life since i was a child i have experienced peace I've experienced joy, and I've been able to love again when that was nothing that I could do with my broken heart. And I thank you so much for that, God. All the glory is God. I didn't do anything. I just received it. He did it. His timing was perfect. I was on the brink of divorce. And let me tell you a little secret. I love my son so much. He means the world to me. And I was actively passing generational curses to my son, and you don't even realize you're doing it. And when he intervened, he intervened just at the right time and made it possible for me to now not transfer those generational curses, but he's given me the power to fight those curses. He's given me the power to stop it. And I pray, I pray that it stops on my back. It doesn't go to his generation or the generations after that, his kids, it stops right here, right now. I've lived a life as a rebel, but I tell you, it's my pleasure to now, I don't fit in it still, but now I'm a rebel for Christ. And it's my pleasure to do that. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, divine healer, I hope that you put your name on everybody's heart that hears my voice in this room. Heavenly Father, we're nothing without you. Please guide us, lead us. We worship you, Heavenly Father. Generational curses stop right here today with anybody that hears my voice. Heavenly Father, you're too powerful. You're too powerful. Thank you so much for all you're doing in our lives. Please continue to bless us and be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Say, but God, by the grace of God, there goes me. 
Jesus over everything. Mike, the blood of Jesus, bro. The blood of Jesus. You can't say that enough. There is nothing that we do outside of the blood of Jesus that makes us righteous. Our righteousness is like what? Filthy rags. Whew. Lift your hands one more time in this place tonight, would you please? Online, wherever you're at, we say this, but we put faith behind this tonight. There is no distance in the spirit realm. God is touching your heart right now. He's awakening the rebels' hearts and turning them soft for their righteousness to Him. If you'll only receive, if you'll only believe. Jesus, tonight, we just thank you for the work that you're doing. And Lord, we just lift you up above every circumstance, every disease, every doubt. Lord, every man-made thing that we've done that's going to burn up, Lord, we put down tonight. It's useless. It serves no purpose. Nothing eternal is going to come from us. So tonight, Lord, we exalt you over all of that. Lord, all the hidden, uh, hidden areas, the, the secret places, Lord, the places we are self-deceived. Lord, Heavenly Father, tonight we ask you to begin to reveal those things to us so we can see and we can change. Lord, we don't want to leave this place the same way we came in. Lord, we give you all the glory in that, all the glory in everything in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody shouted, what? Amen. 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 Well, hey, it's a good Wednesday night. You need to turn to somebody and say, happy Wednesday. It is so good to see you tonight. Welcome back to the Rock Family Worship Center. All of our friends online, we love you. Glad you're with us tonight. Amen. Now we got to dismiss our youth, our preteens, our children's church right through those side doors. Hallelujah. Can somebody give me an amen tonight? Are you awake? Are you excited? Are you ready for more? I lost you on that part. And I'm trying, Nancy. I'm trying, Gary. We're going to do this one more time. Are you ready for more? All right. We're there. Well, we welcome you back. Thank you so much for being a part of our service tonight. If there's no you, there's no us, right? So thank God that you came out tonight and said, I want more of Jesus. Well, we're gonna go to the next step tonight. We're gonna take the tithes and offerings. If you need an envelope, raise your hand. And if you wanna make an offering, we take those too. Hallelujah. Online, behind me, easy, safe way to give. If you have not downloaded the app for your phone, please do that. There are so many benefits. We have so many things available to you through the app on your phone, all right? So if you've not done that, please do that. And as you're getting ready to do that, I want to call up our favorite kingdom keeper person, Mr. Gary Nangle. Would you please come up here real quick? Hey, it's getting close to Sunday again. 8.50. We're going to do something special. We're going to pray upstairs for this country. Would you, do you think we need prayer for the country? Yes. Well, why don't you just come on up and give us a tryout? And you don't have to say a word. Just come up and just support us. Kelly, come on up here, sis. Hurry up. Come on, Kelly. Yeah, three cheers for Kelly. Yo, yo, yo. You don't want to miss it. I am not a morning person at all, and I can't wait to be here on Sunday mornings at 8.50. We definitely have some movers and shakers up there, <laughs> and things happen, and it's kind of like an appetizer to the service, 
a little bit of Holy Spirit before the whole meal. So we would love to see everybody there, and we'll always make room for one more. That a girl. Gary, I, I never knew what Nancy meant by saying you're her little appetizer. Now I know. Isn't that something special? <laughs> I love it, Kelly. So come on out Sunday, 850, right? Yes, don't forget about that. Everybody's welcome upstairs in the upper room. Hallelujah. All right, ushers, come on up, if you will, tonight. Amen. Lord, Heavenly Father, what an honor it is to give to you tonight. Lord, Heavenly Father, to sow seed in the ground that you've prepared. Lord, I pray over everybody here tonight within the sound of my voice that they will open up their hearts. Lord, that their ears will hear and their eyes will see what you have for them. And Lord, that you are opening up relationships, opportunities, thoughts, and ways for increase to come into people's lives so they can sow into your kingdom. We thank you for that in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody shouted, what? Amen. Amen. Well, guys, if you will, go ahead and pass the buckets, the baskets, the brown things. We have a few more things going on. Um, actually, we got a lot going on. I'm only going to share a few things with you. But we have uh, men. We have the ARC breakfast coming up this Saturday at 9 o'clock. Yeah. You know, guys, we've got a lot of catching up to do. I'm just going to be honest with you. Nicole, the We Are group, they had 86 ladies at the bonfire on Sunday night. There, there was a few husbands, too. We batted clean up with the leftovers. And my wife, she preached. Holy schmoly. I figured I had to learn how to run a daycare because she's taking my job. But it, what a blessing to see all those ladies out. And I, I believe they had a cool time, but a good time. And nobody wrecked their cars coming off my hill. Bonus. Bonus. But guys, we'd love to have you. Nine o'clock this Saturday. There's going to be a good time, and we've got a special time because we've got an anointed man of God that's going to be sharing after breakfast, Mr. Vinny Corielli, if he's in the house. He's somewhere around. Thank you very much, Tori. He's probably upstairs or doing something with the kids, but I'm excited. Come out and be a part of that. Amen? Also, Zoe Life, that's going to be Friday the 19th at 6.30 p.m., and John is sharing a little, uh, a little appetizer with us, if you will. Our very own Alex Murray is going to be sharing at Zoe Life this this month she's going to be sharing a transparent testimony so you know if, if you guys gals and guys everybody is welcome to zoe life if you want to have an opportunity for dialogue you want to have an opportunity to go deeper in a more intimate a smaller setting zoe life is for you it's a great time and there's going to be child care right john yeah. going to be child care so no excuses come out and be a part of that amen and also with this is hot off the press Venture, our young adults, Sunday, 1121. We're going to have a guest minister. We're going to have Jonathan Wiley coming back. And some of you young adults know him. He's part of the, uh, the Shuttlesworth family. He married into that family. But this man is a fireball. This guy loves the Lord, and he really connects to the heart of God. So he's going to be back on the, uh, the 21st for the young adults. And I just encourage you, if you're graduated from high school into, let's say, you know, 35-ish, and you're just saying, I want a place to connect. I just don't feel like I really belong anywhere. Come out to Venture. They have child care, married, unmarried, single, divorced. It doesn't matter. We want you to be able to connect with people your own age. Amen? Awesome. Well, we're going to do something for the next few minutes a little different tonight. I had the privilege a while back to meet a godly leader in this community that is leading the charge for... Um, for something that's been around since 1850, 1860, and that's the Salvation Army. And the gentleman that I'm going to call up, he's the major that is stationed here, and to know him is to love him. I'm telling you. When you meet the guy, you realize he has a heart for God, and he's a heart for God's people, and, and I believe he's assigned to this area for such a time as this. Amen? And you know what? A lot of people don't know much history about the Salvation Army, but when you go back and look at how it was started with William Booth, that guy was fire. He, he didn't preach like some of the modern preachers are today. He got out of the pulpit, he went to the street, and he preached fire. He was a part of, of setting, you know, I think it was in England, setting England on fire for the things of God. And this is his favorite quote. I've got to share this with you. You've got to see where this man 
came from and, and what the roots are of the Salvation Army today. He said this. He said, the chief danger that confronts the coming century will be religion without the Holy Ghost. Christianity without Christ. Forgiveness without repentance. Salvation without regeneration and politics. Oh, come on, hear me on this one. Politics without God and heaven without a hell. Whew. Does that sound like some of these mega pastors preaching on YouTube or Facebook today? Not really. But this is the fire that this, that this move of God was birthed out of. And, and I'll tell you something. This man that I'm going to introduce to you tonight, he's going to share for the next few minutes about the vision and, and what's going on right now here in the valley. I believe this is his heart. So if you will, I want you to put your hands together and join with me in welcoming Major Patrick Richmond from the Salvation Army. Come on up, sir, wherever you are. There you are, right there. Brother, get up on stage. You wouldn't know it, but this guy's only about 25 or 30. Nine. Nine. Let's welcome Patrick one more time. Well, good evening, family. Good to see you. Man, it is good to be a part of the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 With Christ as our head, and we are the parts that just... <clears throat> Thank God. We are a part of the body of Christ. Uh, I am honored uh, to be able to stand before you this evening as, as a servant of Christ uh, and to share with you what the Salvation Army is in Parkersburg and the six counties that we serve. Uh, the Salvation Army of Parkersburg is just a small cog of the Salvation Army International, but we're only going to talk about Parkersburg tonight because that's where our heart is, right? Our heart is here. Our heart is at school just down the way. Our heart is in this house of worship and praise tonight. Our heart is at Vienna Walmart. Our heart is where we are and where we live. And so I hope and I pray that this tonight is an opportunity to see the Salvation Army's heart, to see hope as it marches through this community. And so I thank you so much again, Pastor, for the opportunity to stand before you tonight. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. New Living Translation puts it this way. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. May the Lord add a blessing the reading of his word to our hearts this evening. So, I've been in this Salvation Army for the last two and a half years here in Parkersburg, West Virginia, uh, and I've had six other appointments before that. I uh, just came here from Danville, Kentucky, which is just south of Lexington, and before that we were up in Ashland, Kentucky, still part of the MOV, kind of cool, uh, and then before that we were in Nashville, and then we suffered for five years. We suffered for five years for Jesus down in Florida. It was awful. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, we had three separate appointments down there in Tallahassee, Fort Walton Beach, and West Palm Beach. Yes, I do not talk like anybody normal uh, that you'd expect from the South because I was born in the South but raised in Ohio. So, go Buckeyes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here all night. Ah, been married to my beautiful wife of 19 years. Her name is Carrie. Ah, she is the best thing in my life under Jesus. And uh, just absolutely uh, enthralled with that woman. Uh, she has blessed us with two beautiful children, uh, Philip, who's a senior over at PHS, and Julia is a sophomore. And uh, we, we are entrenched in this community. We're involved. Um, we're not just a happy face that wears a uniform and tra-la-las through the day. No, we're, we're here to work. We're here to serve. We're here to be a part. And so thank you again for the opportunity for us to be a part with you tonight. Um, what we do here in Parkersburg, so I don't know if you all know this, but we have an emergency shelter. Um, we're one of two outfits here in Parkersburg, us and Latrobe Street, and so we kind of share the same community when it comes to the needs and the struggles and 
uh, the, the police call-ins when it comes to uh, a majority of our community. And so we have an emergency shelter which houses men, women, and families with children. Um, that families with children part is a real deal, folks. You know, I, I, I got to speak at Jackson Middle School two years ago. So my first year here in Parkersburg, and I had a, a teacher ask me to come in and talk about uh, childhood uh, homelessness. And the, the effect of, of homelessness on our grade school, middle school, high school students. And family, let me tell you, it's real. It's a real deal. And, and we pray that we're a, a place of hope and restitution for these families. We also have a transitional housing project. Uh, we have four apartments on our property where we offer transitional housing for these families with children. That when they graduate from the shelter and they're, they're, they're moving along their way through uh, very intensive case management, uh, that we're able to then get them through transitional housing into you know, a permanent home. And again, we, we talked about breaking those generational curses. Generational poverty is a real thing, folks. It is a real thing, and the Salvation Army is determined to, to be an effective change on generational poverty for God's glory. Amen. We have social services, which we offer rent utility assistance, as well as food from our food pantry, and also uh, clothing vouchers and furniture vouchers from our thrift store. Hey, anybody been to my thrift store recently? Shame on you. No, just kidding. <laughs> Come on out. We'd love to have you to our thrift store. You've got some of the best deals in town. And here's the best part. When you shop at my store, it all goes back into the ministries and the services that the Salvation Army provides. Okay? It doesn't go somewhere off into a, a nut somewhere else. It, it stays here in Parkersburg. And it stays in the ministries and the services that we provide here to your brothers and sisters, to your grandchildren, to your people, to your friends, to our family. We also have a, uh, a kitchen on the back side of our shelter. Uh, we call it the soup line, but really it's, it's got multiple names. Uh, but Trina, Trina is my amazing lead cook. She, uh, she leads that ministry, and we serve dinner every single night to the community. Um, whoever comes, needs a bite to eat, believe me, they're going to leave full. Um, she, she feeds them very, very well. And we also have a program similar to Meals on Wheels. Um, we call it Meals for One, where we take meals from our, uh, our kitchen every lunch, or Monday through Friday for lunch, and we take those to, uh, to those in need. So um, tonight, when you leave, you'll probably see our newest edition of, of craziness and also uh, uh, taking out God's mission to the people. Uh, I have a canteen, which is outside in this parking lot. Uh, it's a, called a RU, a rapid response unit, and it has the ability to take hot meals anywhere. I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece of machinery. It's going to be in the uh, Veterans Day Parade tomorrow, and then it's also going to be at my uh, kettle kickoff or our Christmas kickoff on Saturday. All right, I've bored you with all the fun stuff. So, this is what we need from you. Better yet, this is how we can come together. As a body of Christ, helping the body of Christ, amen? As different parts help different parts, we're going to celebrate together, amen? Amen. So, as the body of Christ, this is what we need. And uh, first and foremost, uh, anybody looking forward to Thanksgiving? Yeah, let's go. Them turkeys. Mm. Can't wait for that sweet potato pie. But here's the thing. Uh, Thanksgiving Day, the Salvation Army is preparing to serve 1,500 meals in its community. Okay? 1,500 meals. And we need an army of volunteers to come out and help us serve, deliver, make, clean up be a part, and my wife wants me to tell you this, we promise you'll be out by one o'clock. Isn't that awesome? So, if you're interested in that event, uh, definitely check us out on Facebook. Um, it's the Salvation Army of Parkersburg, West Virginia. It's our page. Check us out on there. Drop us a line. Send us a message. Uh, definitely ask for Major Carrie Richmond. That's C-A-R-E-Y. Uh, yeah, she's unique and she's beautiful. Um, but definitely check out with her on that day. That's on Thanksgiving Day. We're actually starting to prepare the meals, prepare food. Uh, Camden Clark is making all of our turkeys. Woo! Thank you, Camden Clark. Um, they're making all of our turkeys, and then we are going to start making meals on Tuesday, and then the full send-out will be Thanksgiving Day, Thanksgiving morning. If you want more information on that, see my wife. Okay, cool. Um, number two, uh, 
Kettles are coming. Kettles are coming. Um, Kettles is, uh, is our major fundraiser for this season. Our goal is $100,000, and uh, if we can raise that amount, it will truly help our uh, operating budget throughout the rest of the year. But what this money does is it helps us to do all the things that I started with, from our shelter to our kitchen to our social services, transitional housing. Folks, even though Christmas is when you probably see the Salvation Army the most, we're operating 365 every single day. Why? Because hurt happens every single day. And just because it's Christmas doesn't, doesn't mean that hope isn't needed in August, you know? And so hope is, we pray, through the mission and the ministry and the service of the Salvation Army is all year long. And so Christmas helps us to raise those funds, to meet the need, especially in those dry months. So uh, we are shooting for a total volunteer uh, army this year, a total volunteer effort in our kettles. Last year, we went total volunteer, and we saved $34,000 in, in payroll, okay? We netted the same amount that we did the previous year. You with me on that? So we, had, we said, God, this is you. You can do this. We trust you. We're going to work with you. We're going to work for you, and God, he delivered and so we were able to meet our goal. We were able to meet what we needed to. And so we're pushing forward again this year. So we need volunteers. We're going to ring Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays starting November the 18th. Um, and we're going to ring at all of our locations that we got here in the area. I encourage you, go to registertoring.com. Registertoring.com is our sign-up site. That's where you get on. You can sign up as an individual. You can sign up as a group. You can sign up as a Sunday school. You can sign up as a business. You can sign up as a mom's group. You can sign up as uh, totally awesome dudes. You can sign up as whatever you want to do. Sign up. Help us out because when you stand there and you got this smile on your face because you got the love of Christ in you, amen. Let me tell you, folks, when you start talking to people, they talk back. I've stood at a kettle many a time, and I've heard many a story, and my, my most favorite ones are this. I gave you that dollar because when I was a kid, you helped my parents. When I was, when I was at war, war, I can't tell you how many World War II veterans growing up would put their dollar in and said, you were the one that was there for me. Folks, when we as an army, I'm gonna adopt you. Here we go, you ready? You're, you're now part of us. Okay, congratulations. You're an Avenger. Um, <laughs> but we as the army together, can make sure that hope marches on. That hope that I read about, that's not just for you and me and the goodness of, ooh, praise God, that's for the whole world. And so let's be instruments of change. Let's be instruments of hope. Let's be effective at the calling he has placed on each and every one of us. That his hope in us would be seen, felt, and heard by those around us. I'm going to be outside here tonight uh, as we get ready to leave and as we go. Is there a bite to eat too? Man, you guys are amazing. You know, that's, that's my favorite. When we meet, we eat. Yes. But I'm going to be outside. If you have any questions for me, please don't hesitate. My name is Patrick. I love you. I'm thankful for you. I can't wait for the body of Christ as we are joined together. Serving others. That's others with a big O, folks. As we serve others, may God be glorified. And may his kingdom come here in us and through us. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen. Well, there's the heart, and that's how you can connect. One other way he didn't mention, we've got a kettle out there. It's going to be there for a while. Anything you want to do to support what's happening in this valley, we'd love to have it. It goes a long ways. Amen? Pastor Dave, we're ready. Come on. Let's welcome Pastor Dave tonight. Hallelujah. You know, uh, 
I, I just want to say I have the utmost respect for the Salvation Army as an organization because we ran a volunteer, I, I don't know what, I'm trying to remember what we called it, but it was like we got contacted at the Jackson Church back in the 90s, and we ran a, like a volunteer thing for like 10 years where we did everything. And it was amazing because when they came to us, they said, okay, here's your kettles, collect the money. And we're like, well, what do we do with it? They said, we'll put it in a bank account. And we said, then what? They said, then you give it away. And I'm like, we give it all away? And they said, yeah, at your discretion. I never seen anything like it. And we gave away tens of thousands of dollars every week. And we, you know, it, it just blew me away because I'd sit there and ring the bell at the kettles and our church manned all the kettles. And uh, <clears throat> the, the veterans that would come up, the guys now like me, old. <laughs> Back then I was young. My hair was still brown. And they would come up, and here's what they would say over and over and over. They would say this. Is this the Salvation Army? Yep. I'll give to them. You know why? I'd say, why? They'd say, because when I was in World War I, when I was in the Korean War, when I was even, they said, they came and they gave us stuff. And then they would say, the Red Cross charged us for everything, but the Salvation Army, everything was free. And that's why I give to them, and I don't give to, and I'm not saying don't give to the Red Cross, but I'm just saying that reputation they have around the world is just amazing. And so I highly encourage you. I mean, I put in those kettles every year and always have ever since the veterans told me that, because I'm a veteran, and it just... I'm like, okay, this is the... And then when they let us just give all that money away, it wasn't a bunch of administrative costs where, you know, 30 cents of every dollar goes to actually the people. Oh, no, 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 we gave it all away. It was amazing. It was amazing. So I highly encourage you, get involved, ring the bell, give, and be a part of the Thanksgiving thing. It's a great organization that you can really put your heart into, amen, and serve, because it's good. Hallelujah, it's good. Isn't God good? Amen. Amen. Well, tonight, let's go to the book of Revelation. We've been reading, doing this message called, We Got a Letter from Heaven. And we've been talking about the letter that, of course, was written by John on the Isle of Patmos, but specifically, Jesus instructed John to record seven letters to seven churches in Asia Minor. Someone said something to me this week. Well, I didn't realize all those seven churches were in Turkey, what we would call today the nation of Turkey. And that was Asia Minor, and that's where they were all at. They were kind of a conglomerate. And I've said last week, when you read these letters, this is real time from heaven, so to speak. Because this is the only thing we have. The book of Revelation is what we have that Jesus specifically spoke, red letter print, so to speak, person to person to the church. And I don't know about you, but I would love to know what he would say about us. Hmm? I mean, if, you could, if Jesus was to write a letter to the Rock Church tonight, I would love to know what it would say. Well, I already know what it would say. Because it's in these letters. Because each one of these letters emphasizes different things in culture and history. And each church is emphasized. But one thing I've learned in my years of serving, I can identify with these letters at different times in my life. I mean, one, one, one week I'm like, Laodicea, that's me. I've been compromised. The next week, I'm like, man, I've been, I know I've left my first love. I'm back at Ephesus. And so as you read through these letters, you know, in, 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 when I was in Bible college, they primarily taught us that these letters corresponded with the church age in the sense of the first couple hundred years was this church, the second couple hundred years. But I, I don't agree with that because I can find myself in these letters just in my 
35 years of preaching, I can find myself in these letters more than once. And I can identify with these letters. So we've been through a couple of these. And tonight we're going to pick up on Christ's letter to Pergamum. Pergamum. And uh, again, when you read these, you realize that here are, you know, it'd be like, you know, Jesus writing seven letters to the Ohio River Valley. And he picked out seven churches in the Ohio River Valley who were experiencing things. Well, how many of y'all know it's different in Athens, Ohio, than it is in Parkersburg? Hmm? It's different in, in different, it's different in Charleston than it is in Parkersburg. It's different in, you know, we have churches all through the Ohio River Valley. And I'm telling you, the difference is amazing. We got Mike here tonight. Mike, stand up, Mike. Oh, yeah. Hi, Mike. Mike's from our Columbus church in Reynoldsburg. And, and by the way, Mike preached his first message up there about two weeks ago. Did a fantastic job. And you know how I know you did a good job? Because I still remember what you preached. You preached on the living water and the symbolism of on the feast of the great, the last day of the great feast, the feast where the water was brought. I learned from that message. Amen. It was very encouraging and very good. And that's why I know it was a good message because I remembered it. Amen. I don't even remember what I preached last week, but I remember what you preached. Amen. But um, um, we have this church in Columbus. You talk about day and night. The culture in Columbus, Ohio, or Zanesville, Ohio, or Jackson, Ohio, or Parkersburg, West Virginia, or Balm Dispatch, Brazil, or Brazilian church, these churches all have different issues. Different issues in different communities. How many of y'all know there's a different uh, spirit? The Bible talks about principalities and powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. We know that Satan has delegated certain arch spirits to rule over regions and areas. And so you have these different influences. I like this statement, principalities affect principles. And that's why you have some communities that have... I remember when I was over in Jackson, Ohio, I was over there for 14 years building our first church. And one thing I learned about Jackson, Ohio, man, they have an issue with the fire and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. I mean, you talk about an issue. I fought hell. You know, Paul said, I fought the beasts of Ephesus. Well, I fought the religious devils in Jackson to try to bring the manifest presence of God into the church. But when I came to Parkersburg, I didn't have that issue. I was like, this city is more open to the manifestation of the Holy Ghost than any, I, I, was, I was amazed because the things I got persecuted for preaching in Jackson, no one said a word here. But when I got to Parkersburg, I couldn't get no one to keep their pants on. I never seen so much fornication, homosexuality. I mean, we've been shielded from all this. In fact, two people I brought from Jackson ended up in sexual sin the first year we were here, and they were fine in Jackson. <laughs> Principalities affect principles. Amen. So that's why I say these seven churches were very close in proximity, but they had different issues. They had different Warfare. They had different things they were fighting. And that cultural thing was embedded in these cities. Okay, so now we're at Pergamum. Write the following to the messenger of the congregation in Pergamum. For these are the words of the one whose words pierce the hearts of men. I know where you live. Where Satan sits enthroned. Yet you still Cling faithfully to the power of my name. I know where you live. I got a letter from heaven. You know Jesus knows where you live. He knows where I live. And he also knows where Satan is working in this city and in this community, in this valley. Because a lot of you are not from Parkersburg. You're from Belpre or Marietta or Coolville or Tupper's Plains or Elizabeth. But he knows where Satan's working from. And buddy, Satan, he does have his strongholds, doesn't he? He has his strongholds. He works, you know, 
in these communities. I mean, Patrick would know, you talk about warfare, you start dealing with people that are fighting out of that generational curse of homelessness and poverty, those curses of, of broken homes and families. Man, you'll find out where Satan lives real quick. You'll find out where he fights the hardest. And Jesus knows that. He knows where he's working from. He said, yet you did not deny the power and you stayed faithful in my name. You didn't deny your faith in me even in the days of my faithful martyr Antipas who was executed in your city where Satan lives. Now, tradition says that Antipas was a disciple of John and that he had been commanded by the Roman government to offer sacrifice to Caesar and he refused. He would not sacrifice to Caesar. And so they took him and they had a, one of their gods they worshiped was a big copper bull and they would take and offer human sacrifice and they would take this big copper bull and they put him inside of it and they built a fire under it and cooked him alive. Well, guess what? Jesus said, I saw that, and Antipas is now with me. Think about that. There ain't nothing you're going through. When I read these letters, I'm like, this is real time from heaven. This isn't 2,000 years ago, Jesus. He don't know anything about what's going on now. He was in real time. This was after he had resurrected. There's nothing in your life he don't know about. Anything you're going through, he is in the midst of it. Amen. He is in the midst of it. We talked last week about how important it was to understand that our trials are literally being examined by God to see if our faith is genuine. That is so important to remember. We will be experiencing these sufferings. He said, nevertheless... I got a few things against you. This is the problem with preaching in America. We got all the blessings, but nobody's communicating God's issues with the church. You know, in the, the tongue and the interpretation that came forth after worship, the question was, well, first of all, the statement was, I hear your prayers and I hear your cries. As Sean was interpreting Joe's tongue, I hear your prayers and I hear your cries. But where's your fire? Now, some people immediately would disqualify that and say, well, that don't sound like Jesus. <laughs> what Jesus are you talking about? <laughs> what Jesus are, are you talking about the Jesus of the Bible? Because every time he talked to a church, there was only one of seven churches that escaped admonishment or rebuke or a demand for repentance. And that was the church of Philadelphia. We'll get to that. So out of seven, out of seven churches, six churches, he said, look, you're doing good here, but here we got a problem. You know, I used, to, I used to say this, and I still say it after a lifetime now of experience. One of the hardest things I've ever had to do as a believer, as a leader, as a pastor, as a preacher, is to discern a voice in my head, whether it's God, me, or the devil. Hardest thing you'll ever do is to discern the voice of God. But one thing I have learned when I'm doing good, he doesn't say much. <laughs> kind of like my mom and dad. When I was a good boy, they didn't say much. I mean, I didn't wake up every morning. Mom and dad say, David, come in the kitchen. Yes, we want to tell you how wonderful you are, son. You're like the most awesome son we've ever had. They didn't do that. But when I did something wrong, <laughs> David, get in here right now. Go cut yourself a switch, and don't you bring a little one. My mama made me go cut switches out of the front yard tree. She believed in corporal punishment. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so 
So nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Remember, in Jesus' communication with you, there's going to be as much rebuke as there is encouragement. I mean, read your Bible. Half of it, or more than half of it, is correction. There's more correction in the Bible. Do you know the Bible talks in the New Testament ten times more about hell than it does heaven? Why? Because he knows us. He knows our thoughts. He knows everything about us. He's trying to keep us in the right direction. And he knows how quickly we can lose our way. So he said, I got a few things against you. There are some among you who hold the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to eat things that were sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Now, We've talked about this before, but again, we have to, we're living in a day where every time you turn on your television, now on a commercial for life insurance, there are two girls kissing. You see what I'm saying? I mean, it don't matter what you do. Sexual perversion, there is very seldom you turn on your TV and two married people are shown. It's always, you know, unmarried people that are shown or insinuating that they're shacking up, they're having sex, they're doing this. Eating things sacrificed to idols. Now, that's not a problem in our culture. I mean, you don't go down to the Walmart and you go to the meat counter instead of the vegetable counter where you should be. <laughs> Just thought I'd throw that in for free. You go to the meat counter and there's a section that says, mark down meat. Not because it's going out of expiration date, because it was used in a sacrifice to Dagon, a demon god. So they marked that meat down. But that was what their culture was facing. So they were constantly being told by certain people, you're a Christian now. It's okay to eat that meat. Well, apparently not, because Jesus said over and over in the book of Revelation, I got this against you. You keep eating that meat that was sacrificed to idols. So if he was okay with it, he probably wouldn't have sit and said, I got this against you. In our culture today, it goes back to, well, I'm a Christian, so I could, well, cussing did nothing to me. I'm a Christian. If you're still using obscene language and cursing as a Christian, Jesus would write you a letter tonight and say, I have this against you. Amen. You're still cursing like a sailor. Amen. You're talking like a filthy person of the world. Amen. You're using language that does not represent me. Or you, you think you can, because you're a believer and because Jesus is in your heart now, you think you can... Fornicate. You think you can have sex without being married. Balaam, and this is what you got to see. You got to back up and see the big picture. So I've accepted Jesus. And when I accept Jesus, the Bible teaches about this hedge of protection. The Bible teaches that I have authority. Luke 10, 19, behold, I give you power over all the power of the evil one and nothing shall by, or power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and nothing shall by any means harm you. Woohoo! I got the power. <laughs> right? Satan knows that. Just like Balaam knew that. Remember the story? This is the guy that got rebuked by a donkey. Well, what did Balaam do? Well, according to Moses, Balaam knew he tried, you know, Balak hired him, curse Israel. He said, I can't, God's blessed him. How can I curse what God's blessed? This went on over and over. So finally, 
in, if you read that story, it, it appears like it's over. But you got to go back, you got to move forward in time where Moses comes back and recounts what Balaam did later. He could not curse Israel. So he said, but I'm going to tell you what you can do, Balak. You see, the reason you can't curse them is because they're in a covenant with God. And part of their covenant is they're not allowed to have sexual immorality in their camp. They can't commit sexual sin. So take the prettiest girls you got. Take the prettiest girls you got and dress them up and put them in the doors of their tents and entice the young Hebrew men to come in, get them drunk and have sex with them, and then the curse will come, and you'll have power over them. And that's exactly what they did. And the curse came into the camp. Now, let's fast forward a couple of thousand years. Here we are. We are, the, according to the Bible, the true children of Abraham, children of faith, We've been blessed by God, and we can't be cursed. A demon, what, can a de what power does a demon have over you right here tonight if you stand in Jesus' name? You, none. So what does the devil do? The devil knows if I can get you in sin, I could beat the snot out of you. You try to rebuke me in Jesus' name when you're doing what's contrary to his name, and it'll be a big joke in the spirit realm. And so you say, come out. You know, I'll tell you a true story. I was uh, first started pastoring over in Jackson, Ohio. There was a church that was flourishing. It was the leading church in the community by far. They had a charismatic pastor who was getting it done, man. I mean, they, had, they were exploding in the city. And so one, one day, somebody calls me. Well, I didn't know what had happened because I'm coming in after the fact. This lady calls us and we go to her house and she's wanting to know if we'll cast the devil out of her. And so we go in this woman's house, me and a couple of my leaders, and we sit down and we start counseling and we start praying. And uh, this lady says, this, this, this happened in the city. She said, well... I called the other pastor of this flourishing church to come. And he walked in my house, and the demon in me spoke out and said, I know who you are, and I know what you're doing. And she said, the man turned white as a sheet and left. What well, turned out, he was in adultery. He was in adultery. And he actually ended up running off with the woman that he was in adultery with. She said, the demon in me knew that. And I said, well, you ain't got nothing on this preacher. You're coming out in Jesus' name. And we cast that devil out of her. Amen. But I'm telling you, if, if, if the devil, and here's how he does it. He gets these smooth talking preachers to tell you, you're okay. God loves you. God loves you. And they never say, I got this against you. They never say, I've got this against you. On Sunday morning, you very seldom in this community, unless you're in this church or a couple other churches, be confronted with, Jesus has got something against you. Are you sleeping with her and you're not married? Oh, no, 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 no. That ain't going to go here. You going to repent or you going to leave? You going to repent or you going to leave? Oh, wait a minute. What? You just stole something? What, 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 what are you doing? That ain't going to go here. We're going to tell you what's right and what's wrong here. And we're going to tell you if you do what's wrong, you're not going to expect the blessing of God. Amen. God doesn't bless unrighteousness. Amen. He demands repentance so he can bless. Amen. And so in the same way that these people were holding this doctrine, these teachings of Balaam, now, let's keep reading. Furthermore, you ain't done yet. <laughs> it's like, well, how's come the message is twice as long of the corrective part than in the blessing part? Well, it's probably because you're doing twice as much wrong as right. Amen. Amen. 
He says, furthermore, you have some who hold the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. Now, again, I had to go. No one taught me in Bible college who the Nicolaitans were. I had to go out and I had to do research to find the answers to this stuff. I'd read that for years. About, I think the first time it might have been five to ten years ago. I can't remember when. One day I'm reading that and I thought, well, what the heck were the Nicolaitans? And so I got in and I began to dig and dig and dig and I started getting into church history and I found out the early church fathers like Irenaeus had addressed the Nicolaitans and explained who they are and what they did. But you'll never hardly hear this taught anywhere because it's the same message that's being taught to the church today by what we call the grace message, which is if you're a Christian... Sin is not a big deal because you're a Christian. In other words, I can still do the things I used to do, and I'm okay with God. That's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, is that you could li literally still be in immorality as a Christian, and God was okay with it. That's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. The same message that's being taught in churches all over this community. When Sunday morning, someone sneaks up to the pastor and says, that couple back there, they're living together and they're not married. And the pastor says, leave them alone. Don't say anything. We only talk about what's right here. Yeah. Yeah. It's like when the pastor, who is no longer the pastor, because now he's in court for a sin that apparently he's been accused of covering up children being molested, who is the head of the Hillsong organization. I love Hillsong's music, but I don't like their morals. Amen. They got some real moral issues in the Hillsong churches. Ask the pastor of the New York one that just got busted, and so many other pastors that they happen to close down campuses. Because the pastor of the Hillsong, the senior leader of the Hillsong organization told his pastors, we don't talk about anything that's wrong. We only talk about what's right. And we don't address homosexuality in the church because Jesus never addressed it. Well, he just did right here. Sexual immorality takes in Pedophilia, sexual immorality takes in homosexuality, pornography, prostitution, bestiality, fornication, and adultery. All those fall into a category Jesus calls sexual immorality because there's only one moral sexual practice, and that's between a husband and a wife in the marriage bed. That's it. Everything else is coded immoral. Amen. But we don't talk about that in this church. Leave them alone. Leave them alone. No, no, no. It's crazy, the things going on. I remember T.D. Jakes. I love T.D. Jakes. I wish I could preach half as good as the man can. The man is gifted by God. But when he sits and looks at Oprah and says, and, she, and, and he's questioned about what are your views on homosexuality in the church, and his answer is on national television, I am evolving and I have evolved. Well, what the heck does that mean? Is God evolving? Didn't he say, I am the way, the truth, and the life? My word is truth. Everything else is a lie. I am evolving and I have evolved. They asked Joe Osteen, what do you think about it? That's above my pay grade. Well, then get out of the freaking pulpit. If you aren't qualified to address sexual immorality, you should not be behind a pulpit leading people in spirituality. Bring me on Oprah and ask me what I talk about it. 
I'll tell Oprah and the whole world, it's an abomination in the sight of God. It's perversion. It's demonic. It destroys human people. Come on, Oprah, call me. (laughs) Call me. Call me today. Call me collect. Call me direct, but call me today. I'll tell you what your Bible says. I mean, I don't have the money Joe Olstein has. I don't have the influence T.D. Jakes has because I preach the truth. I got enough charisma. I could be a lot more popular if I just stopped this stuff. I can't tell me people walked in to straighten me out. Now, if you just tone it down, one man told me, we'll fill this place up three times on a Sunday. And I looked at him, I said, that's not my goal. And he said, what do you mean that's not your goal? I said, my goal is to make disciples. And I'd rather have 10 disciples than 1,000 people going to hell in a handbasket, believing a freaking lie to please their flesh. Come on, somebody. You all got me going again. (laughs) You don't have to get me going. You know, I'm like one of them toys. I got one action. (laughs) Preach the word. Preach the word. Preach the truth. So he says, uh, you got those people who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now look at verse 16. So repent, amen, then or I will come quickly to war against them with the sword of my mouth. Remember how he was seen? John saw him, eyes like fire, hair hair like a wool, white as snow, and a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. You think, you think Jesus has got the little silver tongue that makes you walk away from church every Sunday? Oh, I just feel so good. I can't wait till next Sunday to get back. The pastor told me I'm the most wonderful person alive. And I believe it. And your conscience is screaming. Fornicator! I mean, we got men so addicted to porn, they can't hardly sit through a church service without sneaking a peek. Come on. Think about it. So repent. But the one whose heart is open, let him listen carefully to what the Spirit is presently saying to all the churches. Amen. To everyone who's victorious. How many of y'all won't be on the high side of victory, man? There's a reason I quit cussing. There's a reason I haven't had an alcoholic drink since 1982. There's a reason I ain't got an ounce of pot in my car right now and I haven't rolled a joint since 1982. There's a reason I've been married for 41 years this December to the same woman and I am faithful to her. Since 1982. There's a reason my children are not ashamed of me. What a powerful testimony, Jerry. We're so proud of you. I know who you are. You know how I know? I didn't know you a year ago when you came. But one day my daughter calls me. She said, Dad. I said, what? She said, Jerry Pickett's coming to your church. And I'm like, "Uh uh-huh. And what do I need to know? Because Janelle was my rebel who rebelled with you. You dog. You were part of the problem. Ushers, take him outside and stone him. She said, Dad, Jerry Pickett is coming. I said, yeah, and he's loving it. She goes, really? I said, yeah, hallelujah. So he's telling you the truth. If he was running with Janelle, he was wicked. Amen. He was wicked, man. He was running with Janelle back then. My daughter was a rebel for many years. She's a good mom and wife now. Amen. She loves the Lord now. 
And she's leading her children in the Lord. And I thank God for that, just like Jerry is. Woohoo! And I was worse than both of them put together. <laughs> Amen. So to everyone is victorious. I will let him feast on the hidden manna and give him a shining white stone. And written upon the white stone is inscribed his new name, known only to the one who receives it. You know, I remember meditating on that. I'm like, so what's, what's this new name stuff? What's this new name stuff? What you, what's wrong with my name? And as I was praying on that one day, I, I really believe the Lord said this to me. You can take it or leave it. But I believe he said, who named you, Dave? I said, well, my mom and dad. He said, you've been born again. I'm your dad now, and I get to name you. And I ain't even tell him what your name is. It's a secret between you and me. I'm like, okay, what's my new name? I don't know yet. I won't know until I get the stone that it's written on. And that will be an eternal secret between me and my father. And you think about how much he knows you. That he's already, you know, Jesus revealed a few new names. Simon. No, you're Peter. Abram, no, no, you're Abraham. Hmm? Jacob, no, no, you're Israel. Sarah, no, no, or Sarai, no, no, you're Sarah. See, God's about giving new names for new natures. Amen. I don't know what my new name's going to be. Come on up, guys. I don't know what your new name's going to be. And guess what? You will never know mine, and I may never know yours. It will be one of those things that God reserves. Wouldn't it be cool to think there's something that only me and God know? <laughs> Whoo! Something. I mean, this, the special place he has for us is revealed in this. All through the history of the Bible... We see references to the tree of life that we will be allowed to eat from. Whose leaves heal the nations, the Bible says. Here we see we'll be eating the hidden manna. The hidden manna that is hidden for us. I don't know what that's going to be like. But if it's anything like everything else he does, it will be unbelievable. Unbelievable. It will be unbelievable. And so I stand daily, and as I read these letters, I'm encouraged. I know I'm loved, because the Bible says, if God loves you, he reproves you. If God loves you, he reproves you. If God loves you, he rebukes you, just like a father who loves his children, reproves and rebukes. I stand loved. I stand corrected. Man, anytime I'm reading these letters, and like I say, I encourage you to read them several times a year. Just take 20, not even 10 minutes, and read these seven letters, just a couple of chapters. And I promise you'll find yourself over and over and over, but this time you'll be in a different letter because you're in a different warfare. You're in a different season of life. You're in a different relationship. You're in a new job. You'll find yourself in your job on these letters. You'll find yourself in your home. You'll find yourself abroad. You'll even find yourself in your church in these letters. Amen. We got a letter from the king, guys. We got a letter from the king. Let's stand tonight.
that in mind because your pursuit is not in vain and our pursuit of his presence means that we're also in a resistance against anything contrary to his presence in our life that means what we listen to that's why I don't listen to secular music some of you all listen to secular music more than Christian music hey it's a free world you can do all you want but I promise you you're not edifying your spirit You're not edifying your spirit by listening to these, the, I mean, there's some filthy people out there, folks. Look at their lifestyles. Do you really want their wisdom just because it pleases your flesh? I mean, we got parents trading their children's spirituality for maybe the hope of a sports scholarship because they can't be a part of the church because they're at some practice or chasing some ball around America every night. I'm not against sports, I'm against the idolatry of it. Whenever you have to choose between corporate worship and your service to God in your time, your finances, and everything else, to me that's equivalent to eating meat sacrificed to an idol. Anytime you can't say no to entertainment, even though it's it's contemptible to God in its presentation believe me I get aggravated you can't watch nothing anymore it isn't laced with filth I know and I hate it but guess what your pursuit is not in vain and for every pleasure of the flesh you give up on earth you will reward be rewarded eternally in heaven and believe me, the hidden manna is better than some perverted sh movie or show that you're going to watch. And you're like, just to watch a good movie, I've got to put up with fornication, drunkenness, drugs, homosexuality. I've got to accept it all as normal or I can't accept, I can't enjoy this program. Oh, I know, I hate it, man. I hate it. I hate it. But that's the way we live today. Amen. And every time we remember what Jesus, it, it's all through the scriptures. Jesus said it, but the principles all through the scriptures. A little leaven, leaven's all lump. That means the little things we think aren't harmful show up when you go to pray and nothing happens. It shows up when you say, in the name of Jesus, come out. And the devil smiles at you and says, and who are you? I know what you did last night. I was with you at 1 a.m. on the computer. You going to cast me out? I don't think so. Come on. Let's not compromise our authority in Christ by being seduced like Balaam taught and like the Nicolaitans taught the people of God it's just as relevant today as it was in AD 90 when this was written amen it's just as relevant today thank you for coming out tonight our uh, prayer team is going to come up right now if you're here tonight you need something from God. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter what it is. You come up and get prayer. And you believe God with us and we'll believe God with you. Amen. It's never too small or too big to ask. If it's an issue, let's bring it to God. Amen. If it's a concern, let's bring it to God. And let's get agreement. The Bible says one will put a thousand to flight, two will put ten thousand to flight. It's the power of agreement and prayer. 
So if you need prayer tonight, come up and get prayer. Don't forget to be a part of what the Salvation Army is doing this, this uh, season. I, 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 again, I endorse them 100%, and we love Patrick as we've gotten to know him. He is a wonderful man of God. And so anything you can do to help him, let's do it. Amen? God bless you. Have a great, great rest of the week. Amen.